Hello and welcome back to the Hypothesis episode 32. We are back to talk to you about radar. My name is Feely. I'm Patrick. And I'm Leo. Alright, as I have mentioned, today's top main topic is going to be about radar. But before we get to that, are there any exciting news, um, topics that pique your interest? I have some exciting news. I finished my comprehensive exam. Um, I don't know if I passed though, actually, because they don't tell us until Friday. So what they do is everyone writes them during the week, all the people who have to, and then at the end of the week, all the profs in the department meet and they say, okay, who passes and who doesn't. Um, I'm pretty sure I passed, but we'll find out. So by the time this episode comes out, Liam should probably know um, yes, true. the results. Yeah. And hopefully he will be a PhD candidate and no longer just a PhD student. My resume will no longer lie to the world. <laughs> Yeah, so so that that was it was interesting. I actually really enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed the process of taking the exam because I don't know. It's just fun to like talk about physics. So I can't talk. I shouldn't really talk about what they asked me because they kind of they reuse the questions certain years and for certain people depending on the topics you're studying. Um. But so the two books, I, I already said the two books I was studying, Bose-Einstein condensates and then quantum fields coupled to classical uh, backgrounds like gravity. But I won't get into that. Um, but a, a future episode, maybe our next episode actually is kind of related to that a little bit. But yeah, so I'm, I'm happy. Feely, you saw a movie, right? Yes, um... I saw the the new Ant Man, the Quantum Mania one, because oh, you know, me and my physics friends we are curious about the Quantum Mania, and I think most of us realize, like literally the first couple of minutes in, that we have not seen the second one, that we kind of forgot about to have like the second Ant Man. It's like, well, at least you know it wasn't crucial to the plot, so it was fine. We had a good time, I guess. It was like a amusement park, like a, I don't know director was saying it it's like yeah it's like a family comedy there's very little quantum about it and the way it's portrayed quantum is in a way scientifically inaccurate right? it's, it's, it's a fantasy so it's, you know we watch it for fun they did use one term though it's just Schrodinger's cat it's like oh man this is the entire thing that's the only thing that's quantum about, that they talk about is the Schrodinger's cat and but it's really short sec- section of it which they made it hilarious to me. It's like, wow, I thought they would get like a Pixar director for it because like the entire thing is like an animation. Yeah, and um, one thing I noticed in the credits, like my little brother's company he worked for does uh, visual effects and the names are on there. But my brother's name is not. But that's exciting to see that, you know, he may or may not have taken part in that because of NDA stuff. Did you ask him? Is he allowed to talk about it if he did? I don't know. Well, I, I asked him, I told him that like, oh, I saw the company's name on the credits. He's like, oh yeah, the CEO, CEO name is on there. And that's the ex- extent, extent of what he said. Fair mm-hmm. enough. Um, I, I, I know in another Marvel movie, it's like Infinity War or Endgame or one of those big ones. Tony Stark is calculating some eigenvalue problems or something. At the start of the movie, he says like, find the eigenvalue of the... Was it Taurus or the, the Mobius strip? It was yeah, something like inverse that. Inverse Mobius strip. I don't even know what that means, but there's this um this this YouTuber, uh Andrew What's his name? I can't remember. He's a meme guy. Yeah, but but, but he, he actually went and did that calculation. <laughs> That's a joke to be like, you can actually do something. Oh, well, it's like it's a different um what's it called? Feel, right? Because you're doing I can value problems, which is like algebraic, and you kind of solve it using topology. That's interesting. Yeah, Andrew Dotson. Patrick just messaged me in the chat saying, 
So that that's the guy who did it. You can go look that up. You can probably just Google like eigenvalue of a Mobius strip, and his video will be the first one that comes up. But anyway, I I do have some. Um, we've already talked for a bit, but I have, I have a, I have do have an intro topic prepared actually. Um, and so I I found this paper, in where was it? Physical review fluids. And it's called rocket drops, the self-propulsion of supercooled freezing drops. So, so in this paper, they kind of come to this conclusion that supercooled water droplets, um, they've been observed to move spontaneously while freezing in the vacuum. And in one of our previous episodes, we talked a little bit about kind of metastability and supercooled water. Um, we also had an episode where we talked about how rockets work and how they propel themselves off the ground by sh basically shooting a bunch of particles out their bottom end and due to conservation of momentum that makes them go up so it's the same idea as i found that when you have these you, you have these super cool droplets of water so they're in this state where they're below freezing but they're still liquid and what ends up happening is that um due to these little tiny thermal fluctuations in the drop you can get nucleation which is something we also might talked about in a previous episode um Feely, I don't know if you can summarize quickly what nucleation is, because you can definitely do it better than I can. Well, I think we talked a little bit about it. It's, well, I would give the different um, method this time. Mm -hmm. um, think of more like a practical way, right? I don't know if how many people try to create crystal by like, you know, ha have some kind of substrate and you put a little bit of crystal in and it start to build upon that crystal to make a big, bigger crystal, basically. And and it's not exactly well. It's not exactly how the process nucleation works, but it's a similar, right? So so instead of everything kind of spontaneously, like the the entire box spontaneously turned to crystal, that doesn't make that much sense. So maybe a little part would turn into crystal. Maybe a little ball, we call them nucleus, right? So nucleation is creation of nucleus. So the um. If the nucleus become big enough, it expands rapidly to be so the entire box becomes crystal. So that's a pro or, uh, not necessary crystal. It just changed to solid phase, basically. Yeah. So exactly. In these super cool water droplets, um, they're they're very small. They're around like a micron in size. But you imagine you have this sphere of water. And it's it's super cool. So that it it it's in this state that where it should be, um, this metastable state that's not going to exist forever, essentially, and you get thermal fluctuations in it, you get a small little point on it that nucleates, and then from that small little ice that forms within it, it it, it expands out rapidly. All the other water, water molecules that are near it will now freeze, and you get this kind of like branching out effect of the ice. So anyway, what happens is that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, they found that you can take these, these little micron-sized water droplets that are super cooled, and on their surface, what'll happen is that, um, water will evaporate from their surface but it'll be in this kind of vapor equilibrium with with their environment so there they'll, they'll be kind of, there'll be water molecules evaporating from the droplet at the same rate as there's water molecules kind of bumping into the droplet um but nucleation can form on its surface so imagine that one side of the sphere you get nucleation so that one side of it becomes ice and the other side still liquid it turns out that the ice actually evaporates faster than the water does. So you actually get this kind of net force on the particle, like a rocket. You get the ice sides put, spitting out water molecules faster than the, um, the water side is, and that actually creates, due to conservation of momentum, it creates a net force on this little droplet to fire off to one direction. So that's what these, this, this group was studying. Wait, uh, you say... Ice evaporates. I I don't. This yeah, like, no, that's something that can. This is sublimation. Well, it's going from. Uh, is that what it's called? Is that when you go from a gas yeah. to a solid? I don't remember. Uh, oh, well, but from from solid to gas is sublimation. Yeah. So <laughs> somehow I don't know the details of this, but in their paper they talk about how you can for this. It I don't know what type of ice it is because I know there's different kinds. But as the super cool water freezes, the ice on it actually evaporates faster than the super cooled water does. And what do you mean ice evaporates? Evaporates mean liquid to gas. Ice is not well, liquid. Like, you have dry ice or whatever, right? Where it's like there's that. Well, yeah. So it sublimates. Okay. Well, I mean, 
I, uh, and we have scientists here. I, I don't look. I don't know the details. I I trust them because they had a really nice experiment and really matched their model. So they clearly knew what they were talking about. But but water. But the ice is spitting off little water molecules off of it. That's all I know. And it's doing it faster than the liquid side is. Just want to point out the reverse of sublimation is deposition. Just in case you were wondering, like I was. So wait, wait, so, sorry, I got them backwards. Which one's which again? So sublimation is going from a solid to a gas. Deposition is gas to a solid. Yeah, okay. Evaporation's the wrong yeah. term. Sublimation, but... Yeah, I think when I was young, the, the prime example, I don't know if you, they use these here. So in, in, in male toilet, basically, like the, uh, the stall, they would have this naphthalene, um, like, little balls, right? And it's, like, really smelly, so... It turned from solid to gas. I don't know what it's called in English. I think it's kind of like a naphthalene ball. It's like those ammonia kind of thing. Um, we call we call them like um we call them like a smelly ball in my oh. language. I think the literal <laughs> translation. Yeah, it, it, it wakes you up, right? Like ammonia would just pump you up right away. As people try like about to pass out. You have these like ammonia to their nose, and you like. I'm awake. Yeah, it's not a not so, a great smell, is it? Yeah, but it's it's used to cover the p smell of uh, urine. So, and but that's sublimation. Okay, okay. But yeah, so so the the principle is the exact same as a rocket, though. Is that this this little water droplets firing off water molecules from one side more than it is the other? So momentum makes it fire off like a rocket. So they they conducted this little experiment where they basically just kind of draw they, they fire down the little um micro spheres of super cooled water vertically down with gravity and then what you'll see is eventually nucleation occurs and they kind of fire off to the left or to the right or forward in the xy plane in some direction so they measured that with these really good cameras and thermal imaging and they move pretty fast these little micro droplets they can fire off at like what was it it was like a meter per second over a millisecond or something like that. So around 100 meters per second. Not very far, but still pretty fast suddenly. Anyway, I thought that was kind of neat. They have these little mini rockets. Very interesting. I wonder if this can be scaled up at all to like actual rockets or even like vacuum rockets where you don't have to push through the atmosphere or deal with atmospheric effects. It's... But if you could like put them in an a interplanetary rocket ship. Well, I feel like thrusters with water is, is kind of not very good use because we need water. And we feel like, well, you know what? Let's let's spit out water just to go forward. The, the one thing we really oh need to God. sustain life. Sorry, guys. We're in um, <laughs> but the, the Zoom call. Someone just tried to join it called Poop Fart Man. And it's like Poop Fart Man's waiting in the waiting room. <laughs> yeah, that's deep. Is it? Oh my god, yep. Dean, how dare you? That's so funny, actually. We we need we should get him to come talk about his research one day, if he if he wants to. He doesn't want to, but I'll convince him. I'll convince him one day. Anyway, sorry. Uh just to go off of what Feely said, we do have rockets that produce water as output because they use oxygen as the uh one fuel and then hydrogen as the other fuel, and then very reactively combust it in the uh in the nozzle and that produces water so we we do have rockets that produce water which is pretty neat have you seen videos of those like those water jet packs that people have where they have those things mounted on their arms and they spread they have these nozzles in the ocean and they just suck up water really fast and spit it out of their their hand nozzles and from that they can fly around that's pretty that's, cool that's, yeah that's like conservation of momentum too right maybe there's more yeah. to it than that i don't know yeah, I mean, it's just shooting water downwards. I always think so of that little Mario upward. backpack that shoots out water from that old, that older Mario game. I forget what it's called. Sunshine. Yeah, Super Mario Sunshine. That's what that reminds yeah. me of. Anyway, we should probably get on to our main topic, eh? Yeah, I suppose so. Um, so today for our main topic, uh, we are going to be looking at nice, I guess, interdisciplinary topic which is radar um something that is kind of close to what i do and close to my heart therefore um but i 
we want to talk to you about radar today and kind of learn more about radar and discuss what it's capable of because it's very fascinating and very powerful um and it's only been around for 100 years so like a lot of other technology that we have nowadays uh radar's re- relatively recent uh but it is quite powerful especially the things that we can do with it uh it, i i mean there are a lot of natural productions of radio waves whether it's for astronomical purposes or it's lightning in the atmosphere that produces microwaves naturally um there there are just tons of sources of radio and microwaves and um just before we begin talking about radar i think it's important to define the acronym a lot of people might not know but radar is an acronym standing for radio detection and ranging uh so it's using radio waves or more commonly microwaves but they just didn't change the name for whatever reason to detect um objects and also figure out how far away they are and so the radar devices um are everywhere especially in a place like alberta where we have uh automatic speed cameras so if you're going too fast they'll take the picture of your license plate but that uses a radar gun essentially mounted just on the side of the street um but before getting into radar um what are radio waves and what are microwaves so microwave it's uh heats your food up what do you mean (laughs) yeah well microwaves are everywhere around as a thing of phone um phone signal is considered microwave and it's like it's kind of scary people sleep with their phone on the uh, uh, on the nightstand but it's not scary i mean because the you know it's not much in terms of intensity but you know there were concerns people were like well especially men when you put your phone by your you know on in your pocket, it's like, well, it's pretty close to your second heart. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I was gonna say the intensity dies off really fast, though. It's like I, I forget the the rule. It's like a one over r, one over r squared, or something rule. Inverse square inverse, law. Yeah, inverse square law, or something like that. Where as as you increase the distance, it it dies a lot faster. The intensity. So. I mean, if you have it on your your phone on your nightstand, you're probably good. If it's if it's you know pressed against your uh, <laughs> it's pressed against you, then maybe that's a bad thing. Um, okay. Well, we have a skull, right? So it's blocks, but you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't want it. Yeah. It's it's weird though. There's there's waves everywhere all the time in the air. Like, I got my Wi-Fi box right next to me. That's I mean, I don't. I don't that use what kind of waves does that use micro or what radio waves or I don't know but well the, these things are almost like conventions right like you know these their range we just call radio I think radio has very broad yeah. range and microwave is part of it and you know there are names that we specify to certain certain um range of wavelengths or frequencies that that basically have they have different properties, but in a way it's a continuous spectrum of of wavelength. You know, like we just name things like you know, we name dogs like golden retriever retrievers, but they are still dogs, you know. Yeah, but it's it's still wild to think about like all the different all the different electromagnetic waves you have going through you at any given moment. Because like if I turn on a radio, I have a radio back there. Um turn on a, you can change all these different channels with different frequencies and you can there, there's all these wi-fi signals i can connect to on my phone around so there's just tons of electromagnetic waves everywhere at any given time in day-to-day life yeah it's kind of crazy how much i guess microwaves interfere or at least play a giant role in our lives so everything from your wi-fi router to your phone to um most types of communications uh, that aren't say over fiber optics happen using radio waves so gps signals those come from satellites which are orbiting the earth and that's all just radio waves that they send out uh, or, or microwaves uh, and that's something which is interesting is that they, they're kind of used interchangeably so for example your cell phone it will emit microwaves but it's still called radio waves um and and so there are two main ways that these radio waves 
um, can be produced or these microwaves can be produced and they're either high energy where they're uh, usually a lot more directed or just really high energy and then there are lower energy lower power microwave devices so the higher energy one um, that usually involves the use of a vacuum tube uh, if you've ever done the um, if you've seen a cathode ray tube think something like that but it has uh, electrons moving through a vacuum uh, and it's because of the vacuum that and an applied voltage that the electrons are able to fly th freely through it but then you have uh, these metal cavities which um, as the electrons fly through uh, and essentially create a magnetic field that induces an electric field these uh, cavities are able to essentially contain a standing microwave or a standing wave of microwaves which can then be transmitted um, yeah, I feel like for for younger folks, um, they might not be as familiar to the cathode ray tube or the CRT TV that you used to have, right? The the big fat TV that we used to have, like really heavy, really large, and behind it's basically like a cathode ray tube, a tube firing electrons, and um, the wave that came out with hit this the screen, which lights up, right? That's the purpose. That's why there's like a the screening which go from top to bottom as a line. So it, it shoots up to down. That's why when you take a picture of the CRT screen, you don't see a picture, you see like a line. In um unrelated topic, but quick quick side note, in, in one of my group meetings, me and Josh, and Josh was actually a guest on one of our previous episodes, but we were talking to one of the undergrad students who works in my supervisor's group. And um, they didn't know what be being Rick rolled was, and me and Josh felt really old. We were like, "Oh no, it's happening!" And you know, it's probably for the best that they didn't know what Rick rolling was, because I think it's kind of dumb. But anyway, that's all I want to say is that we're we're getting old, boys. Well, to be fair, those are like a niche internet thing, but the CRT TV are they are like global phenomena. I mean, you know, like everybody use it. Well, p people have money use it. Yeah, fair enough. So as uh, going back to the topic at hand, CRT uh, TVs are super cool because they're massive vacuum tubes. Uh, but the vacuum tubes used to produce microwaves don't have to be as big. And that was kind of the, the revolutionary thing was the introduction of the magnetron, which sounds like a transformer uh, robot. <laughs> magnetron. <laughs> not, not a, yeah, I am magnetron. Uh, but it was actually used to produce microwaves in a very small space, such as your microwave oven. So if you have a microwave oven in your house, that uses a magnetron, which is a vacuum tube that's able to produce microwaves uh, at a very high power. Yeah, I think the word microwave has been used like synonymous with microwave oven. We, we forgot about it. It's just microwave. I was like, put it in microwave. It's like, well, well you can't put things in a microwave, right? Like you can put things in the oven that operated my, by microwave. But we use, use this so colloquially that's been so, such a norm to say microwave, but we sometimes forget that our phone has a microwave. You know, we can microwave our food with our phone, but it's not going to get it hotter. You can't put things in the microwave, but you can put the microwave into things. That's the spirit. <laughs> yeah. uh, and speaking about the phone, uh, that that's the other way that microwaves are produced. So your phones are more low powered there's obviously not a vacuum tube inside your phone uh instead it uses uh solid state uh sources for microwaves so usually it's some sort of field effect transistor or fet uh not boba fet but uh another type of fet um so devices like these fets are doped in a specific way that if you apply an alternating current uh to these transistors they are able to send electrons and create holes back and forth and that movement is able to produce microwaves which is really useful when you want to miniaturize the technology and not carry around a microwave oven or a, a CRTV, CRT TV wherever you go. So these solid state uh, devices have really revolutionized how we can communicate because they make microwaves a lot more accessible. It sounds like going to be an episode on communication. But one thing I want to point out is also like, we used to have so many, like, hold so much antennas around, right? Like, you know, old phones, satellite phones, you had to pull up the antenna. Even I had like a pocket TV, which is weird, uh, my grandfather gave to me. It's like a pocket 
screen TV. You have like a really long antenna you put out. The screen is about like an inch and a half, but the the actual like a uh, machine was like like a brick. But it's like tiny, tiny screen, and you have a lot of antenna. But these days, antenna are hidden really well in your car, for example. Part of the I think how the windshield or uh, your your smartphones part of the frame acts like antenna. That's why you don't see much of all all plastic phone because you need metal to conduct um EM wave to read the signal. Yeah, I think. I mean, someone correct me if I am wrong, but I think back back then, before we had mastered the technology as much as we have now, you we we knew how to create longer wavelength waves a lot easier so you had to have like you you know the antenna on your car would be this really long thing because in order for it to interact a lot the things interact when they're around the same size typically so if you have these long wavelengths coming in you need a really long receiver to interact with it to receive the signal so i think we've gotten better at sending smaller wavelength things now and that's like you hear about this 5g internet and that's just that's just a higher frequency or a lower wavelength of some kind of wave so we're getting better at this kind of stuff yeah and i think we're able to provide more information in the signal that's sent out either by like having different phases of the wave uh all being transmitted at the same time uh or for example for those that remember using radio uh if you're young um the difference between am and fm radio so am, AM is the amplitude modulation Whereas FM, I believe, is frequency modulation, and FM is a lot better uh, because instead of trying to essentially play with the the amplitude of the microwaves or radio waves that are being sent out, you can just change the frequency, but all at the same amplitude, which can be a very high amplitude, which means you're you're probably putting more power into the signal and able to produce a better signal that travels through the atmosphere a lot better. Also, it's an infrastructure thing too because. Uh... Well, low frequencies go further, right? That's why when you out of FM range, you turn on to AM, you can still listen to the radio. But back then, it's hard to build. Like, look at uh, look at now our phone signal, four G, five G, right? Well, it's actually not gigahertz; it's like fourth and fifth generations, right? But but the high frequency you go, the more of the towers or infrastructure you need to put down. And some places you can't have 5G. Like Canada is really, I think Canada has 3.5G, not even 4G, right? Because to, to have all these infrastructure laid down costs so much. I think that's one reason, well, probably not that good of a reason that uh, Canadian phones are one of the most expensive in the world, like the phone plans. And that, like the, what, that comment you were saying that, longer wavelengths travel further that again it just comes down to interaction right like smaller wavelengths will interact with more things in the air because you have molecules or walls or whatever right so these long wavelengths they, they kind of just go through everything yeah if you look at your microwave oven like and on on the glass front right like you, you think glass would just like they would just go through it but because you have these kind of net like material yeah, you know, this looks like a like a little uh little fish net going on that actually blocks the microwave. Yeah, and it's like don't put metal in a microwave because somehow something going on in the metal, the bonds or the some the some kind of associated length scale in the metal that is around the same same length scale as the microwaves in your microwave oven, and then they interact with each other, and that's why metal things in the microwave blow up. Anyway. This is all, it's all related because radio, uh, radar, just using waves, but yes, let's not get too sidetracked. Yeah. So unlike, for example, your, your microwave oven, which is continuously transmitting waves into the oven and cooking your food, uh, radar instead uses pulsed waves. And, uh, so, so this is able to actually give us resolution in terms of space. So the first radar devices, or at least radio production devices, were able to send a signal and receive a signal, but they didn't really send it in pulses, or, or they um, just sent it directionally, but it was a continuous signal. So instead of being able to figure out how far something is, it would just say, okay, it's kind of in this direction, but we're not sure where. Whereas kind of after World War I, and between World War I and World War II, radio um, and radar technology really advanced, so they were able to send out shorter pulses, and by sending out a shorter pulse, 
of microwaves, um, they could better tell where an object was. And so by knowing the direction of uh, that a microwave beam is going and the time it takes to go to an object and back, you can figure out pretty well where an object is. And so, for example, in World War II, this was very useful for detecting airplanes, especially ones flying over the English Channel. This was also, um, well, not with radio waves, but with sound waves. You have sonar. So submarines in World War II use that a lot. And sonar's been sonar's always close to my heart because my dad was an electrician and he fixed submarine sonars till he retired. So I, I, I think I that's I think that's why I'm so into kind of sound waves and that kind of stuff these days. But anyway, yeah, sonar is the same idea as radar, just with sound, right? And sound travels a lot faster in water than it does air, so you can do a lot more with it in water than the air. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with sonar, instead of, uh, say, changing the... Well, I guess you're changing the frequency, but instead of, say, changing um, the wavelength uh, of the light, you're changing the, the pitch, almost, of, of the sound. Yeah, well, you're still so... changing its wavelength, but... Changing its wavelength yeah, yeah. and changing the frequency, and that's pitch, I guess, right? Yeah, I guess for sound it's pitch, whereas well, for we don't really have an equivalent for well, you can well light. pitch is just another way to characterize frequency and wavelength. They're all the same thing. Yeah, yeah, but we we don't say oh the color red has a higher or a lower pitch than you blue could light. though. Well, Be light also have an octave, right? People talk about it. I don't know that much about it, but I know you can characterize like colors by their octaves. Yeah, so sounds a bit well, more... Sounds, at least in every day, is more complicated because you have any sound you hear, it's a bunch of different overlapping frequencies where it's, we're kind of just talking about like a monochromatic source of like waves, right? Like a single frequency or something. Or, well, if you send a pulse in a radio wave, like a little wave packet of light that has to be composed of a different other, um, a bunch of other different kind of monochromatic frequencies put together. So it is similar to sound, I guess, like that. But I, I, I don't know the analogy between octaves and light and all that stuff. But at least for, for microwaves, uh, for radar use, they try and just get one, as, as best as they can, one single frequency. Of course, there is a, a little bit of deviation there, um, as with any light source or electromagnetic radiation source but the idea is that if you can send out a very short pulse of uh, a microwave beam it will go to an object and you know how fast light is, travels in the atmosphere which is very close to the actual speed of light in a vacuum uh, and you can measure the time using decently fast electronics which is one of the reasons it took so long to get so good but by measuring the time it takes to go to an object and back, uh, and knowing that the uh, the speed of light in the atmosphere, we can pretty well calculate where things are. And now this is very useful for things like law enforcement, which we might hear about later, uh, and their use of radar guns. Um, and, and so this type of idea was heavily applied in World War II to track enemy aircraft. Uh, so along the eastern coast of Britain and or England and Scotland uh, they had these massive towers uh, and these large transmitters that were strung up that transmitted a pulse of microwaves and then these massive towers with a whole bunch of cables strung between them uh, they kind of looked like the power very large power line towers that might run through your area um, but they had a whole bunch of cables strung between them and those acted as the antenna uh, so, of course, radar technology has greatly reduced in size, uh, and we've also been able to get shorter and shorter pulses that are still quite high power with radar devices. So we're able to measure further um, or more accurately distances uh, based on those short pulses and not having um, as large of a pulse width. But, um, yeah, so, so this type of technology is very useful for measuring distances and by being able to measure just uh, distances and then expanding upon that, we can get a lot of information from uh, microwaves and radio waves. One thing I think you should note, too, is that, you know, we are so used to visible light that we sometimes we don't realize that certain material are opaque under visible light, but transparent under auto wavelength. So things that, that you know, 
we see as opaque when you shine with infrared or UV or radio wave, it might just go through it. You know, there are like the the uh, the properties of the materials are not just apparent properties. There are things that you know it's 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 you have to do experiments to figure that out. And the fact that we can use radars to go through certain things and not to, or even to not go through certain things, that you have to take account of that too, right? So you might be able to find things that you cannot see. Yeah. So so radar, um, instead of say shining light an object and being able to see it, radar more so interacts with the properties of, um, or or the structure of a material instead of its chemical properties. Uh, it does interact somewhat with chemical properties but if we want to say get the structure of something like the smoothness or roughness of a surface then we can use radar to try and figure that out if it's very rough um, we'll essentially receive a lot more radio waves back to the receiver than if it's smooth and it just kind of reflects like a mirror uh, specularly i think what he's saying though is that like if you tried to make a radar gun with a different some other wavelength of light maybe it would just go through the car and wouldn't tell you anything about it. It's like a window, right? Like, you can see through a window, but why is it I can't, you know, walk through it? It's like, well, visible light passes through a window without interacting with it, but other light, it's it's a solid material, you know, matter doesn't go through it. But, like, even UV light, actually, glass is opaque to UV light, typically. So, 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 so somehow when you create a radar gun, you know, if you want to, measure the speed that a car is going you need to use some kind of you need to use some wavelength or some frequency that's gonna not go through a car ideally uh, so, so so that is something to take into consideration for example in remote sensing uh because we have a whole bunch of different wavelengths that can be used for radar remote sensing where we can look from a satellite down from space on the earth and there are shorter wavelengths um so around the centimeter range, which, for example, if you're looking at a forest, will reflect the forest canopy. So you can see all the leaves and all the details at the top of the canopy, whereas longer wavelengths don't really interact with the leaves uh, and will actually penetrate the forest canopy. And you can see the forest floor or even just a little bit below the soil or whatever the medium is that the forest is in. So it's interesting to see that there are some transparencies. Uh, and it's more so dependent on wavelength um, in, in the case of microwaves and radio waves. Um, a, a, another interesting thing with these uh, radio waves that we can send out with radar is if we send out a lot of pulses at once and then try and image an area. Uh, so for example, there are we're able to get really high resolution scans of really anywhere on Earth using satellites uh, that are able to continuously send out pulses, receive the, that information, and then it can extrapolate where it is in the world and where it's looking at. And we can get heights and uh, essentially full world coverage. And there are some satellites that can essentially measure the entire world um, every 6 to 12 days, which is pretty impressive. And then uh, we can also get down to like 2 centimeter resolution from space. Well, we do that to other planets too, right? And, and I think it's much easier because, you know, it's not as dynamic as ours where things change, there are living organisms, allegedly. Um, so when you map Mars, I think we know better than our Earth because, you know, there's no ocean, right? It's easy. When, when you map other planets, are you still sending a signal out to them and it bounces back or aren't you just ret retrieving signals from them, from other stuff that is bounced off them? I feel like Mars is pretty far away to fire a bunch of waves at it and hope that they enough of them bounce back to us. I don't know though. Oh, we have a probe that we send. Oh yeah, I guess if you you know you send it to Mars, but like in outside of our solar system, you can't really do that kind of stuff. You have to just count on light that's already coming from those sources. Yeah, but we send probe out to I think Pluto yeah. even right. Well, so, is, yeah, we got pretty much yeah, covered most of the universe, right? Just just our solar system. Well, yeah, it just it's it's good enough for That's now. That's another I mean, application of radio. Actually, is that you that I think that famous 
new i say new it's not that new anymore but it's still pretty new that black hole image the first image of a black hole that we got that big orange fuzzy blob looking thing what they actually did was they basically turned the earth into a giant radio telescope and they um, measured radio signals from that black hole we talked about that at one point in an episode so radio waves all over the place yeah and i mean radio waves can even be used to see what's underneath the ground Ooh. uh so like like we were saying some it's depending on the wavelength really but you can and the type of material you can actually see beneath the ground so not x-ray technology but you can still send a very powerful uh, microwave signal into the ground and see what comes up so for example with glaciers and with ice uh, on in greenland and in antarctica that's pretty much pure ice down to bedrock and we can actually see all the way down to bedrock using radio waves uh, which is really cool because that's a couple thousand meters of ice that you're looking through just to get the bedrock whereas for other surfaces uh, or other types it's uh, less penetrating so it can go down to 15 meters with things like granite or concrete and just a couple centimeters if it's like waterlogged area well i think one thing to point out about the glaciers maybe if maybe i got this wrong but it's to me it's like kind of weird ice because it's not it's not like you know the liquid that freezes they are like the, the precipitation that got compressed over the years during the ice age right that's why it's so fascinating you know to look at it it's like oh it's a block of ice right but that's that's not all it ha- it is. It's like it's created really by thin layer and layer. That's why when we dig down and just like have a tube of um a glacier of glacier, and we can study what happened millions of years ago. That's why we know it's not like a it's not pure speculation. You know, and this kind of compressed snow that give the history of the Earth, which is fascinating. You know, we see this microorganism the chemical composition of the earth million years ago like wow wow it's kind of <laughs> like rings in a tree right you can look at the rings when you cut a tree um how many of each one is roughly a year or you can tell I, I don't know each ring is tells you some amount of time and depending on what happened to that ring you can determine like the history of the tree it's kind of similar you just dig out this big tube of glacial glacial ice and you look at each kind of slice of it and you're like oh this slice has more you know, something in it than the other ones do. So during that hit period in time on the Earth, there must have been more of this chemical in the atmosphere or something. Yeah, here in Canada, we have the Canadian Ice Core Lab, um, in Edmonton, I should say. Uh, and that's where they essentially go to different glaciers. Um, so everything from uh, glaciers that are pretty close to the tallest point in Canada they've taken ice core samples from. And they have like these giant tubes essentially filled with glacier ice and you can look at the layers for the past uh, it, it's at least a few thousand years i don't think it's quite a million years because we've had some warming periods but uh at least 10 10 or so thousand years we can look back and see what it was like in terms of atmospheric conditions and whatnot so so where were we with radar guns we talked about how they work so so an interesting aspect of radar remote sensing and any radar satellites or radars that mounted on say spy planes or uh the like it's not facing straight down uh, so unlike the imaging sensors of earth or uh laser sensors that we're able to use radar has to look sideways uh, because if you think about it if you send a pulse from say a radar satellite it goes down and then hits two objects that are the same height but at different spatial locations, when that signal returns, it's going to show them as being the same. Uh, so if they're the exact same height, say two buildings in a field, and the uh, radar signal or the microwave signal goes down, bounces off two objects at the same time, it can actually differentiate between the two of them. But if you look to the side and send that same signal out, uh, it will bounce off one of those houses on the prairie first and then the next one second so you can actually get three-dimensional detail from it instead of just saying okay there's something there you can actually say okay this is specifically where things are so this is called side looking radar and it's very complicated but very very cool yeah i think it's a problem with like basis vectors right how, how can you map three dimensions with just one it's just like impossible so you're gonna lose 
dimensionality. I think there's like probably some kind of mathematical theory behind that that I'm unaware of. Oh yeah, ra- ra- I I mean radar itself is pretty mathematical on how you figure this stuff out. So there's a lot of theory behind it, and guaranteed that someone's done some pure math about it for projecting a what one D space into or three D space into one dimension. Yeah, uh, radar I think is just very cool, and it's able to tell us a lot about the Earth and the stars and pretty much everything in the universe because. I mean, even warm things or hot things emit microwaves that we can uh, detect. Uh, or, or things like your car engine, if you have a gas car, will emit radio waves because of the spark plugs inside. So we can, we can tell a lot about what's going on um, just with some microwaves or some radio waves. And it's very cool, especially that it's becoming so much more miniaturized, meaning that we're able to do a lot more with it, like mounted on drones or. Uh, send it to different planets or moons. And who knows, maybe we'll send something interstellar someday that's able to record radio waves. All right, so it seems the radio, you know, I'm excited to see in the next 10, 20 years what's going to happen with the radio technology now that, like Patrick said, we have miniaturized it a lot. So, oh, I think that's going to be the main topic for today. Before we move on to the story, Patrick's going to be telling us about how do you contact us? And if you want to become a guest or so on and so forth. Absolutely. So uh, we are always interested in having guests on our show, but we also welcome questions, comments, or topic suggestions. Uh, we can be found through email. You can email us hyperthesispodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram where we're at the hyperthesis and you can send us a message. We also send updates. Uh, Liam, are there any updates on the memes posted on Instagram? Yeah, I, I made some. I g- gave in to your Excellent. bullying. Oh, good. So if you want to see some hot, spicy, homemade ne- memes, uh, go check out our Instagram and give us a follow or send us a DM if you want. Um, we are also on YouTube. Uh, we've just paused a little bit with uploading videos since it's very resource intensive to actually process them. And of course, they are... Um, designed by feely and they look excellent so if you want to go check those out go check those out they are youtube if you just search hyperthesis podcast you'll be able to find them uh you're listening to us right now so you can find us really anywhere where you find podcasts whether it's google podcast apple podcast amazon music spotify we're based out of anchor.fm slash the hyperthesis where you can find all of our episodes so go ahead and give us a listen and give us a share, like, subscribe, whatever you do on whatever platform. Uh, and also feel free to leave us a review so we know what we can talk about later on or how we can improve. All right. Sounds good. So the story for today is actually is very really impromptu for me. So it's going to be a little fast and loose, but it's going to be the story about the police radar gun. <laughs> Not just about oh popo. Don't get political. We could, but we shouldn't. <laughs> the popo. So this is um, when I read about it, it's like yeah, this is pretty interesting because I never really knew the history of the radar gun. Not that I'm particularly interested in radar guns, but the fact that we have these um speed measuring speedometer or you know speed measuring machine that are handheld. You know, it's, it was inconceivable a hundred years ago, but here we are. And so, in 1932, Sir Robert A. Watson Watt came up with the idea of the RDF, which is, uh, stands for Radio Di- Direction Finding. So he wrote a paper with another uh, scientist, Wilkins, describing this new technique of ranging and detection, giving the code name of radar, of course in 1935, and it was proved that it would work. But with a range of only 80 miles, using the -the state-of-the-art devices of the day, which to me is pretty long. So by the autumn of 1938, the radar system were in place along the south coast of Britain. So Watson Watt became scientific advisor to the British Air Ministry in 1940, and in in 1941 went to the U.S. to set up radar systems there. So 
So he lived from、um, he's lived for quite a long time from 1892 to 1973. So how would you know about the the development of radar? So in 1959, Watson Watt published his autobiography entitled "The Pulse of Radar." So it has a 434 page. It's about information on the development of all types of radar and countermeasures during World War II. So the story is already—it's the story about the 62 years old father of radar. So he got a speeding ticket from a Canadian cop who doesn't know who's giving the ticket to. Well, much less should he care. But it's kind of hilarious. And Watson what wrote a poem about his speeding ticket experience too. That's a little hilarious. Kind of funny to me. <laughs> Imagine you invent something and it gets used against you. It's like, oh, exactly. So, you know, the law enforcement agencies recognize the power of this radar technology. So, in 1947, in Glastonbury, Connecticut,、um, started testing out radar to survey the speeding of like passing vehicles because I think the speed law, speed limit law, was imposed since like the early. Twentieth century, so like nineteen o one or so. But you know there was no way to really accurately measure the speed. So, so in nineteen forty seven, so they debuted the world first speed trap in February of nineteen forty nine, and so the officers work in pairs. So one watching the radar system, collecting visual and printed evidence, and the so when the first officer noticed a speeder. Would radio、um, another officer who parked short distance up the road, giving him the heads up、um, about the plate number, and the second officer would wait in the car to pass the pull and to pull over the driver and issue them the ticket. So that's interesting, but you know, radar technology back then still really large. So there are problems that are solved, have been solved through the following years. First is size, basically. So early radar system were large, like hundreds of pounds large. So because they came into use in like war plane technology was developed later on to make it much smaller. So later they were sized to fit into the trunk of the patrol car. Eventually they shrink down to the like dash mounted and then handheld as we have today. And the second issue is about the. Band, so brief frequency of the band, well, like a bandwidth basically. So the police radar operated in the X band or the Q band frequencies. So these bands are required the radar housing to be very long to accommodate the frequencies for a longer wavelength. So long actually that and the antenna has to be mounted outside of the patrol vehicle. So it's gonna look a little ridiculous. So. X-band frequencies are also not able be able to use in direction sensing radar, so they only able to detect differences in speed between the patrol car and the car in question. So it means it's a relative speed, but not exactly if、um, can determine if the car is moving towards or away from the officer. So to, to calculate speed quickly, that might become a problem. So over time, they start to use the high, higher frequency band radars. That was introduced, so it allows the antenna to shrink down to something that could be mounted on dashboard or be the handheld radar gun. So, but the biggest advantage of these like higher frequencies is that they are directional and have much much higher resolution. So now police radar can have fastest and strongest signal display. So the officer can pinpoint pinpoint. The speeds of smaller cars and even motor vehicles when they are near to larger vehicles, so the resolution is going much better. And these days, you know, that it developed to go digital. Even that, we have the needle that would point to the speed of the car being observed, where the results are quite accurate. In in actually in like a blink of an eye, it's really that fast. So in nineteen sixty nine. Digital readouts were introduced to the new red radar models. To kind of wrap this up a bit, because I don't want to go too long about this story, it'll be a little short episode today. So I'm gonna end with a a, a quote, not really a quote, a poem called "A Rough Justice" by Sir Robert Watson Watt. 
Well, disclaimer: my poetry is kind of self-taught. I don't really know the cadence and the tempo of the reading poetry, but let me try here. Pity, Sir Watson, what strange target of this radar plot, and thus with others I can mention, the victim of his own invention, his magical all-seeing eye, enabled cloud bow planes to fly, but now by some ironic twist. It spots the speeding motorist, and bites, no doubt, with legal wit, the hand that once created it. O oh, Frankenstein, who lost control of monsters, man created whole, with fondest sympathy regard, one more hoist with his petard. As for you, courageous buffins, who may be nailing up your coffins, particularly those whose mission deals in the realm of nuclear fission. Pause and contemplate fate's counterplot, and learn with us what's what's and what. Damn! Thank you that very was, much for today. That was deep. <laughs> that he targeted he targeted nuclear research nice. at the end there. Ooh, that was some foreshadow. Well, not maybe not foreshadowing, but anyway, that was good. I, that poem was sweet. Yeah. Yeah, well, it took me for the first episode in a while. We finished under an hour. Yeah, we so should do that more often, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then I'll talk to you guys later. Take care. Bye, everyone. See ya.